Hi there, everybody. Welcome to another hour of English classes here on Verbling.com. My name is Lisa, and I'm one of the English teachers here on Verbling. And in this hour, we're going to be having a reading class. So if you are interested in practicing your English, your reading skills, learning some new vocabulary, um, then you can join us. If you have a reservation, you can use the reservation now. You get to use your reservation in the first two minutes of the class, and then after, oops, sorry. Um, then after the first two minutes, then the join class button becomes available to everybody. And if you are a Verbling member, then you can join the class at any time. So, welcome. Hi, Nihan. <laughs> Hi, Lisa. I thought about reading about the Oscars, but the last thing I read about the Oscars was how corrupt it was. <laughs> And how they well, never they never pick women, and how it's all white men. Ah yes, yes. Uh, I read the same article. I guess I, I saw it on Facebook that you sent. Yeah, um, I think Nicole. Put it, yeah. We all know about the flaws about Oscar, you know. Yeah. Well, it doesn't matter, I guess. It's a show. Yeah. And that's, tonight, that's it's show time. It's show time. Yes. What time is it? Anyways, like seven or something like that. 6 a.m. in the morning. For you, it's 6 a.m., it'll so be, it'll be 6 yeah. p.m. here. Yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah, are you going to watch the whole thing? Yes, of course. <laughs> I, I haven't waited, waited uh, for it for, for two months. Yeah. And yeah. In, every, in every year, Yeah. I, I watch it. Uh, last year, uh, I, I took a break. That mm -hmm. I, I said to my boss, uh, I had to go to doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. What are you gonna take a break on Monday? No. Oh mm -hmm. no. I don't, I don't think so. I have to go, but, but uh, I think I can uh, watch it two hours. Yeah. Uh, it'll be necessary. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Hi, Lucas. How are you? Hello, Lisa. Uh, I'm okay, thank you. How about, how about you? Good. I'm pretty good. And Anatoly, how are you? Hello. I'm fine, thank you. Good. Welcome. Okay. And Mohammed's joining us. Hi, Mohammed. Just see here who shows up. Hassan, how are you? Hassan from Hassan from Spain. Hassan, are you there? From Spain. Yeah, hi. Welcome. Hi. Thanks. Okay, something happened with Mohammed's connection. He'll be back probably. Okay, guys, I uh, just, I actually found this article this morning. <laughs> Somebody on Facebook had posted it, and so I went and I read it. And I thought it might be something interesting and something new. I haven't done uh, an article from the New York Times uh, recently. So this is an article that's um, appeared today, this morning actually. I think, yeah, Sunday in their Sunday Review edition. Um, it's an op-ed piece, which means it's an opinion um, <clears throat> article. And so it's usually in the New York Times uh, op-ed pieces are written by authors, so people who have written other books on lots of different topics and the opinion piece that they write may or may not have anything to do with um, what they usually write about. It's just something usually that has come up in their life and they have an opinion about it and so they write an article and then in the New York Times especially on Sundays uh, in the print edition a Sunday print edition is very thick so it's like rolled up and it's very thick but of course I'm getting these articles um, online so that we can um, all read them together and it looks like everybody has pretty much gone to the article so I will put it up now in the screen share and I will just say to people, if anybody's watching and they want to join, and if you are a Verbling member, then you can join at any time. If you are not, 
yet a Verbling member, then you are free to watch the show, which is us, <laughs> having this class. You can watch um, and read along with the article, and then perhaps um, in the future, if you're interested in joining Verblink so that you can uh, join us and read along with us and ask questions and uh, be a part of the class, then you can join uh, Verbling. It's $45 a month, and that allows you to take uh, classes anytime, which is pretty amazing. So we have lots of different teachers, men and women, from the United States, Canada, and other English-speaking countries. We live in different countries. Um, at the moment, so we can teach classes at all different times of the day and the night. Um, I live in the United States, in the state of Washington, so for me right now, it's the morning. It's a little bit after 9 a.m. in the morning. Okay, and let me just welcome uh, Chi. Hi, Chi. And Mohammed. Yeah, hello. How are you? Hi, Hi I'm doing well. Thanks, Hi, Chi. Lisa. Yep. Uh-huh. Hi, Mohammed. Chi, where Hi, are you how are from? You? I'm, doing good. Uh, I'm from Hong Kong, but now I'm living in the UK. Oh, okay, great, yeah. wonderful. Okay, well, welcome to everybody, and um, I'm going to remind everybody too. Nihon is reminding people in the Verbling chat um, the best way to uh, participate in classes here on Verbling is to keep your microphone muted. Uh, the reason why it's good to keep your microphone muted is so that we don't hear background sounds and even sometimes just moving around depending on your microphone or your headphones sometimes just even breathing or moving around we um, uh, some of us hear sounds and some of us are sensitive uh, if we have headphones in our ears it can be kind of loud for us so the best way to do it is um, when you're in class is to just keep your microphone muted while somebody else is talking and then when it's your turn to speak or to read out loud, then go ahead and remember to unmute your microphone and then we'll be able to hear you. And the easiest way to unmute your microphone is just click on the microphone um, on your little picture down here in these squares. And then it'll be uh, unmuted and then we'll hear you. So the way the, the reading class works, for those of you who are new, um, I just read out loud. So, for example, I'll read this first paragraph, and as I'm reading, that's a chance for you to listen to how I'm pronouncing the words and listen to how I'm reading the phrases, kind of my, my tone of voice, my up and down, that's my intonation of how I say these things. So, that's kind of your model, and then... Um, everybody will have a turn to read, so I will probably just start over here with Anatoly, and so we'll go just in order of you guys in the line there, and, and then it'll be his turn to read, and he will read out loud the same thing that I just read, so that will be uh, his chance to read and practice his pronunciation, and then after that, so we read it actually two times, and then the third time is when I'm going over the words. So I've highlighted some of these words here, and um, and so I've highlighted them so that I will go over there and explain them a little bit. And if you if you have any questions, you can go ahead and unmute your microphone and ask me a question. Uh, but if you don't have any questions, then you can just keep your microphones muted. And you can also use the Verbling chat to um, uh, ask questions or comment on things uh, as we are reading. Okay? So if, if we hear noises and you haven't muted your microphone, somebody might mute your microphone. Don't take it personally. Don't get upset. <laughs> Just know that it's because we, we're hearing noises and it makes it difficult to uh, either hear me or hear other people talking. Okay? All right, so this is an op-ed piece. It's called Soviet Era Sex Ed. A few months ago, my 15-year-old raised her eyes from her homework and asked me if I knew what smegma was. I had no idea. She explained the term and then invited me to identify the Cowper's glands on a diagram of the male genitalia. I pointed at something that looked glandish to me. No, Mom, she said with a patronizing smile. That's a seminal vesicle. Okay, Anatoly. Okay. Uh, uh, a few months uh, ago, my 50-year-old uh, uh, raised her eyes from
from uh, her homework and asked me if I knew that uh, smegma was. I had no idea. She explained the term and uh, then invited me to identify the Cowper's uh, glands on a diagram of the male hen genitalia. Genitalia. I, genitalia. Mm -hmm. I pointed uh, at something uh, uh, that looked uh, glandish to me. No, ma'am, she said with a uh, patronizing smile. That's a seminal vesicle. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. And uh, right. I, I have mm -hmm. a question about title. What uh, does it mean, Ed? Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. So we'll start there. Soviet era. So this is, of course, referring to the Soviet Union era, the time period that the Soviet Union was um, a country. And sex ed is short, short for education. So ah, ed. Yes. Whenever you hear okay. the word ed is short for education. So you can have sex ed or you can have physical ed which is like we call that PE here in the United States where you do sports and stuff. Um, so yeah, that's just short for education. Just like okay. ad, A-D is short for advertising. Yeah, sometimes we shorten the words. Okay, so here we go. She, so the author is the mom, we get that, and she has a 15-year-old daughter and so she raised her eyes from her homework. So basically, she looked up. So she's doing her homework, and she looked up to raise Ming's to lift up. So she and she asked her mom. So kind of like you know, I wonder if my mom even knows this stuff. So what is smegma? <laughs> so smegma is a funny word. It's white stuff. So of course, sex ed, you're learning about the sex organs, the glands, the anatomy, and also what happens during sex, stuff like that. And so smegma is a uh, kind of the white stuff that both men and female genitalia can have. You can look it up. Uh, if some of these words, it's uh, easier just to type in the word and do a Google image search, and then sometimes you'll see uh, exactly what it is rather than trying to understand the meaning of it. So of course uh, the lady says, "I had no idea," which means she didn't know what it was at all. So she, exp her daughter, explained it to her. She told her what it was, and then she invited her or asked her, you know, to identify Cowper's glands. So um, I'm going to give you guys this link, and you guys can open it up. <laughs> and it's the male genitalia. So, <laughs> so <laughs> Niha, I don't want to. Uh, have Nihon uh, uh, freak out or anything. <laughs> so you guys can look at that. That's a that's a diagram of a male genitalia. So the genitalia is a Latin word actually, and in English we use it genitalia, or we can say genital or genital area. So it's this is part, part is a gland that is identified on the diagram of male genitalia. So the the sex organs of a man. Okay. I pointed out something that looked glandish. So in English, whenever we're saying something, we can put the I-S-H at the end, ish, to mean it kind of looks like that. So glandish, like a gland. So it looked glandish means it looked like a gland. If somebody asks you, for example, what's the color of your uh, new shirt? You can say, oh, it's kind of blue-ish. So it's not totally blue, but it's blue-ish. It's like blue. So whenever you see that word, something like a regular noun, like gland, and then you put the ish, that is I, I'm telling the person it's, it's not exactly that, but it looks kind of like that. So, or you think it looks like that. So you might see that blue. You, we do it with colors a lot: bluish, reddish, greenish. It has a greenish, yellowish color. You could say, for example. Um, so she said, no, mom, and she said it with a patronizing smile. So patronizing is when you think you know something more than somebody else. So it's kind of uh, you're telling them, like, oh, you know, poor you, you don't really understand this. <laughs> so you can imagine a teenager and saying, like, my mom doesn't even know these things, you know. And then, of course, that's, uh, she says, that's a seminal vesicle. So you can see the seminal vesicle. It's another part of the structure or the anatomy of the male sex glands. If you looked at that diagram, you'll see it on there. 
Her class discussions didn't sound quite as baffling. She tested me on the question, what makes a person a good lover? A, skills. B, passion. C, confidence. D, shape and size of their genitals. I guessed B, passion. But the correct answer, she assured me, was C, confidence. Okay. Asan? Asan? You can read that part there. So. There you go. Yeah. Um, I must uh, read? The, yes. Yeah, yes. read the part that I just highlighted there. Okay. Her yeah. class discussion didn't sound quiet as baffling. She test me one uh, on the question. What makes a person a good lover? Skills, patience, confidence, shape and size of their genitals. <laughs> uh, I guess uh, B, patient, but the current answer C, uh, as, uh, assured? Assured, me. yeah. Assured, assured. was uh -huh. C, confidence. Uh huh, good. Okay, so uh, she says her class discussion, so that when you have a discussion, it's like the conversation that you're having, or, um, you know, when everybody's talking, that's a discussion. They didn't sound quite as baffling. Baffling means confusing. So they weren't as confusing as this part, the, the actual anatomy and the structure of the glands and, and things like that. So she tested me on the question. So this would be a discussion question. What makes a person a good lover? Okay, uh, and <laughs> this word here is genital. So uh, you say the the soft G sound, j genitals. And so these were your four uh, multiple choice. That's called a multiple choice question. You have multiple choices, and you you choose one. And of course, the mom guessed passion. You know, probably being in her thirties or forties. <laughs> um, but the correct answer was confidence. So to have confidence is makes you a good lover. Um, to assure somebody, I bolded the whole thing so that you learn how to say the whole thing. So she assured me. You could say I assured her or she assured him. But to assure somebody means to um, tell them um, that, you know, yes, this is the right answer. You're, you're making them uh, Feel like this, you know. You're you're guaranteeing them, for example, or um, what's another word? <laughs> to assure somebody means just to to make to ensure them that this is right. So she said, "Mom, C is right. I know I'm right." You know, she's assuring her um, that B is not the correct answer, but C was <laughs> for the test, anyways, or for her class. <laughs> My daughter then waved me away because she had more homework to attend to and apparently I wasn't any help. I let her ponder the difference between scrotum and epididymis in peace, but I did wonder if the amount of information she had to take in was a little too much. It was certainly better than nothing, which was exactly the amount of formal sexual education I got in my teenage years in the Soviet Union. Okay, Chi, your turn. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, my daughter then waved me away because she had more homework to attend to, and apparently, I wasn't any help. I left her wondered the difference between scrotum mm -hmm. and scrotum and it is epididymis in okay. peace. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I did wonder if the amount of information she had to take in was a little too much. It was certainly better than nothing, which is which was accurately the amount of formal sexual education I got in my teenage year in the Southern Unit. Mm -hmm. In the Soviet Union. Soviet so, Union. Mm -hmm. My daughter then waved me away. So you can imagine the scene. Uh, actually, here is kind of a good picture. This is the article. So here's her daughter, like a picture, you know, of her daughter. <clears throat> um, 
studying her book and you know figuring out looking at diagrams of the sexual genital areas of men and women and trying to figure out things and, and then her mom is not really very much help <laughs> so she waves her away it just means she takes her hand and she just says okay you can go away now <laughs> and you wave your hand it tells somebody like okay I don't need your help anymore so uh, she had more homework to attend to so that means to do or to finish so if you attend to somebody it means you take care of them you you ask them what's wrong but if you attend to something else like your homework or to a job it means you're going to work on it you're going to finish it up um, so apparently so um, it apparently means like it appears so it seems like or it looked like she didn't really uh, she wasn't able to really help her so she says apparently I wasn't any help <laughs> I let her ponder so to ponder means to think about so if you look at the diagram I put gave you guys the link to you will see uh, so she's gonna ponder or think about the difference between scrotum and epididymis so those are also two other um, portions of the male genitalia which you can see they're labeled on that diagram so she's gonna let her do that in peace without you know bugging her or asking her any more questions but she says here it was she did wonder if so if you wonder if it's kinda like you ask yourself is this too much information so if you wonder I wonder if you know, I wonder, like for tonight, Nihon is going to be watching the Oscars, so she's going, she could say, I wonder if uh, this movie will win, or if this actor or actress will win. Or you could say, I wonder who will win. So it means you're thinking about it and you don't know yet. So uh, you're asking yourself the question. Um, so she's saying the, the amount of formal sexual education, so formal here means you actually take a class versus informal so informal would be like you learned it from your friends or watching a movie or TV or something like that but a formal way is when a formal education usually refers to taking an actual class so um, her daughter is having a class in sex ed or sexual education but when this uh, mother grew up in the Soviet Union she didn't get any so she got exactly none about uh, any formal education about this topic. I first attempted to obtain some information about sex at the age of 10. Marek, Marek Shaknovich, my boyfriend at the time, had suddenly announced that he wasn't going to marry me. His reasoning was that I would want kids, which would require sex, and sex was disgusting. That evening, I convened an emergency meeting with my best friend, Katya, with three questions on the agenda. A, was sex disgusting? B, was sex necessary for making kids? C, what was sex? <laughs> okay, a little ten-year-old. All right, Lucas, your turn. Uh, I first attempted to obtain uh, some information about sex at the age of 10. Uh, Marek uh, Shakonovich, my boyfriend at the time, had suddenly announced that he wasn't going to marry me. His uh, reasoning was that I would want kids, which uh, would uh, require sex and sex was disgusting. That uh, evening I convened convened, 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 uh -huh. convened an emergency meeting with my best friend Katya with three, three questions on the agenda. Agenda. Agend, uh -huh, agenda. Agenda. Uh, A was sex disgusting. B was sex necessary for making kids see what was sex mm -hmm. good okay so I first attempted to obtain so to attempt means to try and then obtain means to get so another way to say this was I first tried to get some information so she tried to figure out what this sex thing is you know when you're 10 you don't actually maybe know especially back then maybe 10 year olds know more now <laughs> I don't know but um, 
All right, so she tried to get some information, and the reason why is because her boyfriend is not going to marry her, and his reasoning, so his reason why or his thinking is that she would want to have kids, and that would mean sex. That would require sex, so you would have to have sex, and sex was disgusting. So if you think something is disgusting, you think it's gross. You don't like it. You're like, ew, I don't, I don't like that. So you could, you know, sex could be described as disgusting by a 10-year-old boy. And also food, a lot of times food is described as disgusting if you don't like the way it looks or tastes or feels in your mouth. Um, so it's how something usually looks and how you kind of feel about it. It's You think it's disgusting and sometimes it makes you feel uh, like you're grossed out or something. Um, so that evening I convened an emergency meeting. So to convene a meeting means to call a meeting or to have, tell people we're going to have a meeting. So she had a meeting with her best friend and on the agenda, so on the agenda for a meeting is what's going, what you're going to discuss. So she had these three uh, questions about it, what, trying to figure out what does this even mean. Uh, we asked around, but nobody had answers for us. Our families were no help. My mother said, you'll know it yourself when the time comes. Katya's mother refused to discuss that filth. When I asked a recently married cousin how he felt on his wedding day, he simply said, I felt like a fool. Where else was there to go? Okay, Mohammed. We asked around, but nobody had answered for us. Our families were no, no help. My mother said, you'll know, you'll know it yourself when the time comes. Katya's mother refused to discuss that filth. When I asked a recently married cousin how he felt on his wedding day, he simply say, said, I felt like a fool. Where else? was there to go. Mm -hmm. Good. So um, to ask around, it means you go, you walk around, you go around and you ask different people. So to ask around just means to ask several different people um, and apparently nobody could help them. Uh, their parents didn't really want to tell them so they said things like this, you'll know it yourself when the time comes, so when you when you probably are married or when you're older and, and it happens, you'll just know. And uh, her friend's mother refused. So when you refuse something, it means you say no. So she was not willing to discuss or to talk about, and she just called it that filth. So she's referring to sex. And filth means something dirty. So she referred to it as that some you know dirty thing that people do, so that's not very uh, uh, you know <laughs> doesn't really help kids usually. Um, and then of course her her recently married cousin, so somebody who had just been married, said he just felt like a fool. So maybe he didn't really know what he was doing either. Um, where else could they go? All right, there were no books on sex, no magazine pieces. None of the TV shows or movies ever mentioned the physical side of love, with the possible exception of the 1979 hit film Moscow, Moscow Does Not Believe in Tears. In one scene, a man leads a woman to a sofa, gently urges her down, and then they engage in a lamp switch struggle. He turns it off. She turns it back on. He turns it off. She turns it on. Off, on, off, on, off. The screen fades to black, and in the next scene where the woman appears, she is pregnant. Whatever it was that caused her pregnancy was left in the dark. Okay, Nihan? <laughs> it was really funny. <laughs> There were no books on sex, no magazine pieces, none of the TV shows or movies ever mentioned the physical side of love, with the possible exception of the 1979 hit film, Moscow does not believe in fears. The once seen, a man leads a woman to a sofa, 
gently urged her down and then they engage in a lamp switch struggle. He turns it off, she turns it back on. He turns it off, she turns it on. <laughs> off, on, off, on, off. The screen fades to black and in the next scene where the woman appears appears she's pregnant. Whatever it was that caused her pregnancy was left in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. <clears throat> so, she had nothing to help her out here except for maybe. Okay, so none of the TV shows or movies ever mentioned. So to mention something means to talk about it or at least say something about it. So they never mentioned the physical side of love. So a lot of movies, of course, show people you know, becoming in love, falling in love with each other, but the physical part of it is the actual act of sex. What does it look like? What do you do? Where, where, what is going on? That's what a 10-year-old girl is trying uh, to figure out um, based on her boyfriend's <laughs> words. Um, but there are possible exceptions. So an exception is <clears throat> when everything is a certain way, then you have an exception, so it's like a difference. So the only exception to that idea that there was nothing was this one movie. Um, so you, you can imagine the scene, a man urges her down onto the sofa, to the couch. So he's to urge somebody means like to try to convince them, you know, to, to ask them, come on, let's do this, please. Urging You're urging somebody to do something. And then they engage in. So to engage in something means you, you, you do this, you know. So they're having a lamp switch struggle, turning it on and off. So the switch is where you turn it on and off. And the struggle is like, you know, he's turning it off, she's turning it on. That's like a little fight, a little struggle there. But, of course, uh, the, it ends with off. And then the screen fades to black. So to fade means it's light, and then it slowly goes to black. And then, of course, the next scene, she's pregnant. But a 10-year-old girl doesn't really know how that happened. Katya and I scanned dozens of books, greedily hunting for even the smallest bits of information about sex. All of them were rubbish, plenty of hints, but no facts, despite titles that were so promising. Madame Bovary, Bellamy, Great Expectations, Arabian Nights. To be fair, Arabian Nights did have some vivid descriptions of a sexual act, but the flowery language made the particulars rather confusing. Okay, Anatoly. Yes. By the way, I watched this movie and uh, I also read uh, uh, Arabian Nights when oh, I yeah. was a child. Katya and I scanned dozens of books, uh, uh, greedily hunting for even the smallest bits of information about sex. All of them uh, were rubbish, plenty of hints, but no facts, despite that titles that uh, were so promising. Madame Bovary, Belle Ami, Great Expectations, Arabian Nights. To be fair, Arabian Nights uh, did have some vivid uh, description of a sexual act, but uh, the flowery language made the uh, particulars rather confusing. Mm -hmm. Good. <clears throat> so they scanned dozens of books. To scan something means to look at it quickly. So they didn't read all every single word. They're just like turning the pages looking for something. And it's described as greedily hunting for. So greedily, when you're greedy, you want everything in your... So you can imagine two girls just like going quickly through all of these books looking for something that will help them understand what sex is. The word They just have the word sex. They don't actually know what it is. <laughs> so they're greedily trying something. You can uh, use the word greedily like when a child gets a bunch of candy and they're greedily eating it. They means they like one after another. So that's the idea of how that's uh, described. All of them were rubbish, so rubbish is like trash, There's, there wasn't any good. Um, plenty of hints, so lots of hints. A hint is like it tells you a little bit of information, but, it, but no real facts or no real details. Um, despite titles, so despite having the title, so despite means like even though, even though the titles sounded good, they were promising, 
Um, to be promising means like it sounds good, you might get what you want from it. <clears throat> um, they didn't have any uh, particulars. So even Arabian Nights, even though it did have some vivid, so this word vivid description, so it means it did really tell you what was happening uh, of a sexual act. You know, vi they, they were describing in uh, words uh, very vividly uh, what they were doing, but it was using a kind of flowery language. So it wasn't very, like, um, fact-oriented. It wasn't very clear or concrete. It was kind of, you know, using a lot of words that maybe that are like feeling words and descriptive words, but you maybe couldn't, if you're 10, maybe you couldn't really understand exactly what was happening, where were, where were the body parts going, and that kind of thing. So those would be the particulars, the details. So she was just uh, confused. <clears throat> and then, when I was 16 years old and ready to date, Perestroika happened, and the tiny kiosks by the subway stops were flooded with cheap foreign goods. Racy lingerie, cosmetics, tampons, chocolates, liquor, porn magazines, long expired condoms, most of that previously inaccessible, could all be purchased at the same place. The burgeoning yellow press was filled with stories of incest, bestiality, necrophilia, and rape, 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 rape. My friends and I were consumed by dreams of pure romantic love and simultaneously drowning in all that violent sexual imagery. We felt even more hapless and clueless than when we were kids. Okay, so now she's 16. Asan? It's very difficult. Um, <laughs> and then when I was uh, 16 years old and ready to date, perestroika happened and the tiny kiosks mm -hmm. by the subway stop were flooded with cheap foreign goods, racial lingerie, cosmetics, tampon, chocolates, liquor, porn magazines, and lots of spurious condoms. Most of that's previously inaccessible. Mm -hmm. cool. Uh, all be purchased mm -hmm. on the same place. The, um, I don't know, bur bur burgeoning yellow press was filled with the stories of incest, bestiality, necrophilia, and rape, 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 rape. My friends and I were consumed by brains of poor romantic love. And uh, simul um, sorry, sim simultaneously uh, drowning in mm -hmm. all that violent sexual imagery. We felt uh, even more helpless and clueless mm -hmm. uh, yes, than mm -hmm. when we were kids. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when she was 16, perestroika came. So perestroika um, is a word that describes the um, opening of the Soviet Union. So when they were they allowed uh, Western stuff, more Western stuff, to come into uh, the Soviet Union. And so these tiny kiosks, so kiosk is like a little stand where they sell things. These were um, outside or next to the subway stops. They were flooded with, so that means they just had a, a ton. So usually a flood is when there, it rains a lot, and then the, the river overflows, and then the streets can flood with water. But in terms of stuff, to flood, uh, be flooded with stuff means just there's an abundance. There's a lot of all of these cheap foreign goods, so things that were coming from other countries, usually the West. So racy lingerie, so racy kind of means like, uh, you know, sexy and a little bit kind of, uh, you know, in racy is when it's, um, yeah, sexual basically, so it lingerie, it's kind of dangerous, I guess, and the lingerie, of course, is what women wear, and so it was probably very, what we call skimpy, so it was very sexy and very intriguing, um, and something that was not previously available, so it was new. And then all these other things, um, she says, previously inaccessible. So it means they did not have access to buy these things previously. So before, before perestroika in the Soviet Union, uh, people did not see a lot of this stuff. It, it was not available to buy. 
Okay, so they uh, now though they could purchase. So to purchase means to buy. They could buy it all at the same place. All these various things could all be bought in that one kiosk uh, by the subway. And of course, at the same time, there was uh, the burgeoning yellow press. So the press, of course, is the media, the newspaper at that time. Yellow press means when the type of newspaper that just reports on all the violence and all the bad stuff that's happening, and it exaggerates it. So burgeoning means growing. So they had this growing uh, media, but it was the yellow press. So they were they were um, filling the newspaper with stories of all of these bad things that are all uh, related to sex, but in a violent way. So incest, you know, when you're raped by your parents or relatives, bestiality, you know, all these things are very negative, harmful, uh, criminal things related to sex. So. Um, so they were dreaming of pure romantic love and at the same time, so simultaneously, at the same time they were hoping to fall in love and really you know, have that be a pure experience, they were at the same time drowning in. So they were like it was just too much. They were having all of this violent sexual imagery um, around them in the, in the form of these newspapers and people talking about these stories and stuff like that. So they felt even more hapless. So hapless means like uh, discouraged, you know, um, hope, kind of like hopeless, like they didn't know what, what was right, what was wrong, they didn't know anything, and clueless. If you are clueless, it means you have no idea. So you, you're not educated, you don't understand something, so you're clueless. So they were still like not getting good information about sex. Um, my dates so she's, you know, this is, this is the woman talking. My dates ranged from mildly awkward to horrifyingly embarrassing. My ignorance and confusion were boundless. The main character in one of my earliest stories, Love Lessons Mondays, 9 a.m., has this line. I wasn't a virgin, or at least I didn't think I was. I wasn't entirely sure. Let's just say I didn't invent this situation. One of the reasons I married early was to avoid more dating embarrassment. Okay, Chi. Okay, and my days ranged from really awkward to horrifyingly embarrassing. My ignorance and confusion were bonus. The main chapter in one of my earlier stories, Love Lesson, Mondays, 9 a.m. Has this night, I wasn't a virgin, or at least I didn't think I was. I was entirely sure. Let's just say I didn't invent this situation. One of the reasons I married it early was to avoid more dating embarrassment. Mm -hmm. So um, her dates, so going out with guys, um, ranged from, so to range from, it's like from, from uh, you know, could be really, it's like a continuum so from here to there. So it ranged from mildly, so sort of, or a little bit awkward, so kind of weird, kind of not very comfortable. That's on one side or one end of the stick, you could say. <clears throat> and then that's the range. So there, you know, her dates were, just, you know, just kind of awkward, kind of like oh, I don't really know what I'm doing. To this other side of the the line or the stick, you could say, horrifyingly embarrassing. So terribly embarrassing. Like oh, I can't believe that just happened. So she was having her all different types of dates with guys. Um, her ignorance. So there, her ignorance. She didn't know anything. She wasn't educated. Um, she didn't have an understanding of what she was supposed to do, what he was supposed to do, that kind of stuff. And her confusion, so being confused about um, sex, were boundless. So they had no end. It had no bounds. It was just like um, a lot. So she was very ignorant and very confused is what that means. She even wrote uh, a story, one of her first stories, uh, and in it the character says, I wasn't a virgin. So a virgin is somebody who has, a woman who, or a man, who has never had sex before. Um, and she says, I didn't think I was. I wasn't entirely sure. And then she says, let's just say I didn't invent this situation. So she didn't make it up. 
So it's probably based on her real life situation. This idea, she didn't even know what it meant to be a virgin or, or what that even means. So she just was very confused. And that's one of the reasons why she got married early, just because it was too embarrassing to be dating guys and not knowing what was going on. By the early 90s, when I was leaving Russia for the United States, my sexual education was officially over. I was married, pregnant, and equipped with a teacher's diploma. As I sat in the cab on the way to Sheremetyevo, Sheremetyevo Airport in Moscow, fighting tears and bouts of morning sickness, I hoped that my children would start their sex lives in far more favorable conditions. Okay, Lucas. By the Aries, uh, Airy 90s. Uh, when I was leaving Russia for the United, United States, my sexual education was officially over. I was married, pregnant, and equipped with a teacher's diploma. As I sat in the cab on the way to, I don't know, <laughs> Shermet. <laughs> yeah, Shermetyevo. Shermetyevo. <laughs> Sherimetsiva. <laughs> yes. Okay. Sherimetsiva. Uh, I was in Moscow uh, fighting tears and bouts of, bouts of, mm -hmm. bout of morning sickness. I hoped uh, that my ch children uh, would start their sex lives in far more favorable conditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she was leaving Russia. Her sexual education was officially over, so she wasn't going to learn anymore because she was married. <laughs> um, she was already pregnant, and e this word is equipped with. So um, to be equipped with something means you have it. So she had a diploma, a teacher's diploma. Uh, it also is related to the word equipment. So you can be equipped with certain gear that you need, like if you're going skiing or mountain climbing or something like that. So in this case, she you could just say she had a teacher's diploma with her. Um, so she was in the cab, and she was fighting tears. So fighting tears means she was trying not to cry because she's leaving her country. Um, and she was also at the same time having bouts of morning sickness. So a bout of something means episodes or a little... Um, little time periods when you're having that problem. So you can have a bout of um, morning sickness, which is like what women have sometimes in the first few months of being pregnant. They get sick. Maybe they throw up a little bit or they just feel nauseous to their stomach. So she was dealing with that bouts of morning sickness. And while she was doing that, she was thinking that her she would hope she would want her children to um, start their sex lives in more favorable conditions, so in better, in a better condition or in a better way, knowing more. When the time came, I happily signed the release. My daughter's Manhattan Public School required for a semester-long health class that included topics like female genitalia, male genitalia, behavior on a date, STDs and pregnancy. I had talked to her about these topics, but I was hoping that a professional would do a much better job and that the classroom atmosphere would be less awkward than our one on one. Okay, Mohammed? Okay. When the time came, I happily signed the release of my daughter's Manhattan Public School required for a semester-long health class that included topics like female genitalia, genitalia, male genitalia, behavior on a date, STDs, and pregnancy. I had talked to her about these topics, but I was hoping that a professional would do a much better job and that the classroom atmosphere would be less awkward than our one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. okay. So she happily signed. So um, in schools here, um, for example, to take a class like this, the parents have to sign a piece of paper, and that's called a release. And it allows, it says, yes, my daughter can participate in this class. You also have to sign a release 
if they go on a sporting event or if they're going on a field trip somewhere, those kinds of things. So it's called a release and it allows your son or daughter to participate in the class or the event or something like that. And it is required, like a legal requirement, to make sure the parents said it's okay. And she knew that they would have uh, be talking about certain topics, so certain um, are areas of study. A topic is a subject matter. So these different ones, and uh, Nihon put it there, an STD is a sexually transmitted disease, so they're going to learn about that, and also behavior, like how you should act on a date. Um, and she had talked to her, so previously she had already talked to her about these types of things, but she was hoping that a professional, <laughs> so a, t a teacher who is trained to have a curriculum and to do this, um, and would be better, so would do a better job. So would do a better uh, what, job at teaching her daughter these things, and that the classroom atmosphere. So the atmosphere is like the mood, like what, how it is, how it feels, um, would be less awkward than her, you know, one-on-one -on -one trying to teach her daughter about these things. And for the most part, I am very happy with her class. The teachers did an excellent job discussing safe sex and the position of the clitoris. But some particulars of sexual anatomy were just a bit too particular. Do teenagers really need to know the temperature of sperm or, say, the difference between frenulum of labia and vestibular fossa? I just wish you would be left with some sort of mystery, I told my daughter. Oh, we have that, she said. The mystery is what sex feels like because none of us has any idea. Okay, Niha. And for the most part, I'm very happy with her class. The teachers did an excellent job discussing safe sex and the position of the clitoris. But some particulars of sexual anatomy were just a bit too particular. Do teenagers really, really need to know the temperature of sperm or, say, the difference between frenulum of, mm -hmm. yeah. of labia and... Vestibular fossa. <laughs> <laughs> fossa, yeah, vestibular fossa. Um, I just wish you would be left with some sort of mystery, I told my daughter. Oh, we have that, she said. The mystery is what sex feels like because none of us has any idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Funny> article. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so... Um, so for the most part, that when you say something like for the most part, that means like you could also just say mostly are, um, it means, you know, maybe not 100% happy with it, but for the most part, so mostly. Uh, she was very happy with her daughter's class. The teachers did an excellent job discussing safe sex, so talking about using some type of um, birth control usually and also talking about sexually transmitted diseases that's what it means uh, when you talk about safe sex the position of the clitoris so again they learned about the anatomy of uh, both the female and the males um, but some particulars so she uses this word a bunch in the article uh, some of the details so the anatomy so your anatomy of your body is where everything is including like you know even your muscles and your bones and all the different structures of the human body she thinks they were a little bit too particular, so too much detail. Like, do you really need to know all of this stuff? Like, if you're not going to be a doctor, for example, do you need to know all the different parts? And so she asked this question. Do teenagers really need to know the temperature of sperm, for example? Is that, like, important? Um, or, say, the difference between, and then these are two different structures of uh, the women's uh, genitalia. So the frenulum of labia and the vestibular fossa. I just wish you would be left with some some sort of, so some kind of mystery, something unknown. You know, why, you have to learn every little detail about this. And, of course, her daughter says, well, yeah, we, we don't know what it feels like. <laughs> so they might still be able to, on a piece of paper or on a picture, on a diagram, label the diagram, this is what this is called, and this is what this is called, of course, but they have no idea. She says, none of us has any idea. So none of the teenagers in her class have had sex yet, apparently. That's what she's saying. And so they don't actually know what it 
feels like to be putting those parts together, <laughs> except for, you know, now that they know what they're called and what the names are. All right, and the lady who wrote this, this is her name right here, Laura Vapnayar, and she has written a couple of novels. So, And this is the link to the New York Times article, which I said here was in the Sunday Review, and it's an opinion piece. And so, like I said, opinion piece is just written about your opinion. So it's kind of a good model if you're interested in, in writing, uh, learn, you know, practicing your writing. It's just expressing your own ideas about things and also telling a little bit of a story. So she, you know, she related it to her own experience as a young child and a teenager trying to learn about sex in a time period in a country where you didn't have very much information. So I'm curious. We have four minutes left. Does anybody want to um, talk about how did they learn about sex? Um, in the United States, uh, most, uh, I think, sometimes 15 is actually kind of late. Usually you take it in sixth grade. You have some type of sex education class, and so that's usually around the age of 12. They learn something, not maybe so detailed as she's describing, but they start learning about things because women, uh, girls are starting to ha going to have their periods and things like that. So, Nihon, you mentioned your mom uh, told you the stork story. Is that yes. what you learned? <laughs> <laughs> that the, the stork course, bring, uh, brings the babies. <laughs> yes. Even, even uh, she was a teacher. Uh, uh -huh. She told us that story. Yeah. Uh, yes. We didn't believe it, uh, me and my, my brother. Uh -huh. But uh, I th uh, I think I learned it about a joke. I I heard a joke and a joke? it was uh -huh. about sex. Yeah, it was about sex, and uh -huh. I think that joke um, a little bit. Then I understand you know, hmm. what was happening. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I was fourteen. Uh huh. A little bit late. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, it's interesting because I have a niece, and uh -huh, I, yeah. I, I bet she will learn in maybe three or four years. Uh -huh. Maybe when she'll be uh, twelve, yeah, she would probably know what happens. But <laughs> in in those years, uh, yeah. it was kind of a taboo, you know. <coughs> the parents. <coughs> Didn't like yeah. to explain uh, some details. Actually, it, not yeah. details. <laughs> they, they they didn't want to explain anything. <laughs> Nothing. Um, so, is it part of a Turkish education nowadays? Then, in, will she learn it in school? You think? Mm, like in the article, say it's kind of a what is release or? Yeah, like a yeah. You have to have a release signed. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, in in the mid school, yeah. the parents uh, <clears throat> has to sign a release. Mm -hmm. In that way, their uh, their child could take that kind of classes. But I'm not really sure about the details. Yeah, yeah. So here it's it. We could say it's offered. So it's offered by the school, but you can refuse. So for example. Um, some maybe religious people might refuse because they want to teach it themselves. They maybe want to teach it yeah. from a biblical standpoint or something like yeah. that. You know, even yeah. the religion <clears throat> classes could be refused by parents yeah. if they don't want to to te they don't want to learn uh, their ch their child to, mm -hmm. to to teach about religion rules or something. Uh huh. They can refuse to, to to take that kind of classes, but mm -hmm. I'm not really sure about the sex education. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Anybody else want to say anything? Anatoly, did you did you resonate with this article? Is this what was this your experience in Russia? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, the uh, the author described it uh, uh, fair enough. Mm -hmm. I remember. Uh, my friend, when I was uh, 
when I studied in school, yeah. educated educated me about uh, uh, that question, <laughs> and uh, I couldn't believe uh, because I I couldn't I asked him and uh, kings uh, and uh, queens uh, <laughs> do eat. <laughs> it was impossible. <laughs> Imagine <laughs> even the kings and queens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> okay, you guys. Well, we didn't have much time to talk about it, and I don't want to keep you guys because maybe you're going to move on to other classes. So let me just say thanks for coming and, and being up for reading a story like this. Maybe you learned some new words. <laughs> maybe. <Yes. laughs> At least it was fun. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. So it's definitely an interesting topic, and everybody around the world has different uh uh, thoughts about how you know how how a kid should learn about it. What's a good way, and you know all those things. So, but it not not very often talked about openly. So we'll see. Yeah. Okay, guys. Uh, maybe I'll see you later. I have more classes today, and if not, I'll see you another time. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, Bye. take care. Thank you. Bye, bye, guys.